It's very good morning, colleagues from the international media. Thank you very much for participating in the third weekly virtual meeting. And I hope that everyone is doing well and keeping fit. Colleagues, last week, I briefly mentioned about the synergy between the central and local government to ensure that the policies and effort to fight COVID-19 and its socio-economic impacts work well. So synergy is key. Therefore, I'm very pleased to have General Tito Karnavian, Minister of Home Affairs with me today. Minister Karnavian will brief you on how the local government works hand in hand with the central government and how the local wisdom and values contribute to address this challenging situation. And I'm also pleased to once again have Professor Viku Adisasmito, Chair of the Expert Team of the National Task Force for the Acceleration of COVID-19 Mitigation. And before I give the floor to Patito, allow me to convey some information and updates. My first point, in the last few days in Jakarta, you have seen the number of new COVID-19 cases slowing down and more people recovering. These are, of course, very encouraging signs. However, we will not be complacent despite this development. We will monitor further development of cases in other parts of Indonesia so that the local governments can better prepare in fighting against COVID-19. That is why, based on the request of the local governments to the central gover local governments, the central government has issued large-scale social restrictions in various regions that we consider as red zone, following the increase of confirmed cases in the areas, thus allowing those regions to contain the spread within its region and to contain spread to other regions. My second point, the Minister of Transportation had issued Regulation number 25-2020 on the 23rd April 2020 on the transportation management during mudik period. This regulation is part of our strong effort to curb the spread of COVID-19. What I would like to underline here is that this regulation excludes the international flight cargo flight as well as domestic flight from non-red zone areas. Furthermore, the regulation will not hamper the flow of goods in Indonesia, including during Ramadan and Idul Fitri. This is important point that President Jokowi always reminds all the cabinet members. My third point we are fully aware of possible risks related to imported cases, including from Indonesians returning from abroad. Therefore, there is no other choice for Indonesian authorities but to strengthen the health protocols upon their arrival in Indonesia. Yesterday, we had another special meeting chaired by the Coordinating Minister for Human Development and Culture to discuss, among others, strengthening health protocols at the entry points in Indonesia. To give you an illustration on how many Indonesians are returning, from Malaysia alone, since 18 March until 29 April, around 68,000 614 Indonesians have arrived from Malaysia by sea, land, and air transportation. And then around 11,864 cruise ship crews from 17 countries have returned 
to Indonesia so far. As much as 1,381 Indonesian from many parts of the world have also written back. Furthermore, the Indonesian Agency for the Protection of Indonesian Migrant Workers estimates that approximately 33,000 Indonesian workers abroad, I repeat, 33,000 Indonesian workers abroad will have their contract expire in three months. While now we also expect another 2,339 cruise ship crews returning home. So to mitigate the possible risk of important cases, the government have issued several policies. First, we need to make sure that all incoming Indonesians comply with all mandatory health protocols, especially at the point of arrival in Indonesia. And we try to do the same at their point of departure. Second, we have designated, we have designated entry points for Indonesian re returning home by air, Jakarta, Bali, Makassar, Medan, by sea, Batam, Tanjung Priok, Penoa, Dumai, and Tanjung Balai Karimun. Third, at each entry point, there will be dedicated quarantine facilities for those who have symptoms. We also dedicate transit facilities for incoming migrant workers before they go back to their homes in various areas in Indonesia. For those Indonesians who do not have symptoms, they are strongly encouraged to conduct self-quarantine at home for 14 days. The local government, or even at the village level, will also mobilize effort to ensure quarantine measures are complied. And Patito may explain about this later. So understanding the magnitude of this challenge to break the chain of the spread, this is where strengthened synergy between central and local government can prove to be vital in the fight against COVID-19. Colleagues from the media, my fourth point that I would like to share today is to update on the international cooperation related to COVID-19. In the last seven days, President Joko Widodo has been in close communication with other leaders, with the President of the United States of America, President of South Korea, Prime Minister of Japan, Prime Minister of India, and the President of Iran. Through these meetings, the President underlined the need to address shortages of medical supplies and medicine, including through innovative cooperation for joint production, and then the importance of expediting research for COVID-19 vaccine, and also ensuring equal access to medicine and COVID-19 vaccine once it found at affordable prices and the importance of enhancing cooperation to mitigate economic impact of COVID-19. On my end, I continue to engage with fellow foreign ministers through various virtual engagement. The ASEAN-US Foreign Ministers Meeting on COVID-19, the weekly ministerial coordination group meeting, and the, the, the last one was the phone conversation with Foreign Minister of UAE. On all my communication, I always mention about vaccine. Yesterday, during the press briefing, I mentioned that under this current situation, Indonesian diplomacy has and will actively strengthen multilateralism with the ultimate goal of creating fair access of for developing countries and LDCs to vaccine and drugs at affordable prices. 
So colleague, that is all from me. And now I have the honor to invite Minister Tito Carnavian, Minister for Home Affairs, to convey some information. But Tito, the floor is yours. Thanks very much indeed, Ibu Retno, Minister of Home, uh, Foreign Affairs of Indonesia, my colleague. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. What I'd like to share with you to, uh, this morning is that in relation to my role as uh, Minister of Home Affairs, uh, my main role is that uh, to supervise and oversight the local governments. So in Indonesia, we have got uh, 34 governors, provinces, and also for 514 uh, regencies and cities led by uh, either head of regency or bupati and uh, mayor. So since the beginning of the outbreak, what I'm going to do uh, and have done to the local governments is that to build awareness. This is a very important point because if you've got the same mindset, then you can interpret and explore on the operational and tactical level in parallel from local government to other local government and from local government to central government. So the way I build up the awareness is that to wake them up with the sense of crisis. The narrative I build up is that we have got a crisis, we have got a global crisis, and this is the widest pandemic we have ever since humankind present. Well, we have got a number of pandemics before, such as Black Death in the 14th centuries, to, uh, that suffered Europe and Central Asia and claim 70 to 200 casualties, fatalities, I mean. But again, in terms of size of area, only covering Europe and Central Asia. We have got also another pandemic, which is also claiming a huge number of human beings, Spanish flu. 1917-1919, claiming almost 70 millions. But again, it's not wide enough compared to COVID-19 that covered and affected almost all countries in the world. But today, as far as I know, 213 countries in the world already affected. And again, this is the first time in the history of human being we have got almost all countries in the world affected by a single pandemic, namely COVID-19. Similarly, in the case of Indonesia, this is the first time ever since independence of Indonesia, 1945, we have got pandemic that has affected all provinces in Indonesia and almost 300 cities and regencies. All provinces. We have got a number of uh, outbreaks before, such as uh, dengue, malaria, but mostly 
local or affected a few provinces. But again, it is first time ever COVID-19, all provinces in Indonesia affected, then it is multi-dimensional uh, crisis because uh, starting from the health crisis, so it, it is creating a domino effect in which then you have got another domino already affected, namely finance, financial crisis because of the revenue also being plummeted, then it can go down to the next domino economic effect. That's why uh, the government already launched social safety net to net and to stop economic crisis becoming a social crisis that can go to the uh, security crisis. So sense of crisis is very important to be informed to all heads of local government so they are aware. Why sense of crisis is important? Because it can affect also the mindset, the way of thinking. If we have got a sense of crisis, then our mindsets would be overreactive or overestimate rather than underestimate or underreactive. When you have got the overestimate mindset, then you will prepare the worst scenario. You know that COVID-19 outbreak based on the studies and also lessons taken from other countries. Mostly the graph is exponential. It is, it is growing, rising very rapidly and dramatically because of the spread of contagion. So it's better to have a mindset of overestimate than you will prepare everything and it can also dictate your operational your operations and tactical level in such a way just in case you have got worse scenario you have been prepared on the other hand of the coin if you are thinking it is not a crisis you are staying relaxed then, well, even though it is natural, you are relaxed because it is, you are thinking it is not your problem until the problem already in the face of yours. So, if the mindset is underestimate, then you are not prepared for the first scenario. Every effort you have done or you are going to do, mostly minimum again as the result then you are panic or not ready not prepared if the scenario really come up on your face so this is the way of thinking i shared with all of heads of uh, local governments then i developed also i already instructed to uh, heads of local governments in preparation of overestimate, we have to do it systematically, even though local government, of course, since Indonesia is now being decentralized, mostly decentralized, except uh, six affairs, defense, security, uh, foreign politics, then uh, religion, uh, legal system, but mostly other affairs in the hands of local governments. So local government already responded to the outbreak 
according to their wisdom or their own judgment. So as a central government, Minister of Home Affairs trying to provide a guidelines in which central gov uh, local government have got almost similar uh, system of management could be templated and copied by one to another. So there are five prongs of strategy in the management in handling of uh, COVID-19 and its impact. Number one is that the strategy of containing the spread. So containing the spread is very important and it is the main job of us because this is the main enemy, the virus. We have to contain the spread of the virus, whether it is from socialization, to educate people, testing, tracking, physical distancing, wearing masks, and also some restriction, such as uh, home quarantine, uh, hospital quarantine, area or territory quarantine, and what we call is PSBB. This is the restriction for large-scale social gatherings. This is the cluster of strategy number one, containing the spread of the virus. Number two is that uh, to improve the immunity system of our citizens. So we have got only two scenarios. You are being affected or infected. Then you try to avoid being infected until, you have, until somebody got the vaccine or have got the medicine for that. But second scenario, given the fact that the contagion is very easy through three methods, I believe all of you already know that uh, then you have got a fair infected. When you have been exposed, the scenario we are hoping is that your immunity system is strong, could produce antibody, that, that it could kill the virus inside the body. So improving the immunity system of citizens, such as encouraging citizens to do exercise regularly, consuming nutrition uh, plus vitamin, such as vitamin C and E, sufficient uh, sleep, for instance, less stress in life, having a good lifestyle, which is very important to boost our immunity system. This is the second strategy. The third strategy is that to improve and increase healthcare system. We need to provide and add some more medical personnel, including volunteers. Improvement of health supporting facilities for quarantine, emergency hospitals, in all areas, in all local government. Then, of, of course, uh, improving the, the testing method, providing some more labs, they fall into the category of improving the capacity of healthcare system. Just in case you have got worse scenario, casualties, curve, is rising, they are still below the capacity of our healthcare system. Number four is that the impact. The impact 
particularly, we have to prevent the crisis to be a social crisis. That's why we need to provide social safety net, whether it is uh, uh, by cash or staple foods, particularly for the less fortunate people. And number two, we provide also assistance that our business, whether it is a big business, more specifically a medium scale business and micro and ultra micro business remaining survive. Because otherwise unemployment could be risen then it could be another, uh, generating another problem for us. Social safety net and economic uh, effect of the crisis being considered and need to be addressed as well. This is the fourth strategy. And the fifth or the last strategy is that to improve our food security and health industry. Food is very important in this COVID-19 crisis. In my personal view, there are two items are urgently needed by people. Number one, anything relating to fighting against the COVID-19, health. And number two is that things relating to our tummy, food. People really in need in food. They are scared with COVID-19, but they, they need something for their tummy so that not to be hungry. When you are hungry, can be very emotional, even can get killed as well. So food security is very important. That's why we encourage all local government to provide anything they can do, again, to fulfill the requirements of the people of their own people in their own local governments, in their area, to, pro to have sufficient food. And we are, Indonesia is blessed by the God that since it's located in a tropical area, we have got sunshine throughout the year, we've got a fertile soils, more than 100 volcanoes we have, even though we are put in the ring of fire, but the good side of it, again, the fertile soil, so people can, can grow anything, particularly the quick harvest products, plants, such as sweet potatoes, cassavas, paddies, vegetables, fruits, and we've got abundance of ocean or sea products, such as um, fish. Now we have got oversupply of fish. Again, abundance. Since the chain of supply, particularly uh, for the market, restaurants, hotels, most of them suffered and closed. So we've got an oversupply. So we encourage local government to uh, trade with the provinces with the oversupply of sea products to fulfill, to meet up the requirement of protein to, for their citizens. And also health industry. Why health industry? You know that Indonesia has got a lot of raw materials for our health industries. Everyone now needs 
hand sanitizers, alcohol. So we have got again abundance. We have we are a green country. Abundance of raw materials such as palm, plants, coconuts, fruits, everything can be converted to be alcohol. And again, to be converted to be hand sanitizers or alcohol related products to kill the virus. We are also the biggest producer of palm oil. And you know, palm oil can be uh, used for many kind of things, from oil to margarine, ice cream, vitamin, soap also, you know, the virus, you know, is very sensitive to soap, whether it is hand soap or washing soap, whatsoever. We have got a burden. This is, Indonesia is number one. Number one, what we can do is that, what we need to do is that to encourage the, the owner of palm oil companies from only producing and exporting crude palm oil to produce, you know, uh, the things that relates to the COVID and also for food. So there are five prongs already introduced to local government. Now the local government already uh, work and in order to uh, execute the five strategies within the management of COVID-19, they need of course money, budget. So Minister of, uh, the President already issued an instruction, number four, 2020, and then follow up by uh, Minister of Finance, producing an, a regulations, Minister Regulation number six, 2020, and myself also produce uh, regulation number 20, 2020, to instruct local government reallocate and refocus their local budget to three things. Number one, relating to health. Number two, whatever relating to uh, social safety net. And number three, economic impact. Particularly, again, to assist and to help the uh, business people, particularly the middle income or medium scale and uh, micro and ultra micro business remaining survive. So for the time being, we have, we have uh, based on our data, in total, local government already provided some 63 trillion rupiah divided into three for healthcare improvement, capacity improvement, some uh, 25 trillion rupiah, social safety net, some 26 trillion rupiah, and almost 8 trillion. I repeat, 10 trillion rupiah for economic impact. So, uh, along with the central government already uh, reallocate uh, the central government budget, we are hoping that uh, this sort of reallocation, both central and local government can fulfill uh, any necessity, any requirement in fighting against the COVID-19, hand in hand, central government and local government. And Ibu Retno, 
just mentioned and already pointed out that, well, uh, God willing, that um, the number of confirmed cases and fatalities uh, can be going down. And we suppose also that uh, it is still going down, then we could contain the problem. Thanks very much indeed. Bapak Wiku. Oh, I, can't, I return uh, to Ibu Retno, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Patito. Colleagues, now, as usual, we move on the Q&A session. And so far, we have received questions from 11 media. Sydney Morning Herald, New York Times, CNA, Moroccan Press Agency, AFP, China Central Television, Sky News, ABC, NHK, Straight Times and Nikai. And Minister Tito will answer questions related to social restriction measures. And Professor Viku will provide you again updates on technical data and details. And for my part, I will address question in the main three cluster. First cluster is question related to the balance between public health and economic interests. And then the second cluster is related to a, uh, international cooperation. And then the third cluster is about foreign nationals in Indonesia. So let me start with the first question, especially this uh, answer is to respond to the question from the AFP on how Indonesia government balances between public health and economic interest. Colleagues, since the very beginning, President Jokowi has stated that the public health is Indonesia priority number one. So health and safety of the people is our priority. A healthy society, a healthy nation must firstly be ensured prior to discussion on other aspect. But at the same time, everybody knows that the socio-economic impact of COVID-19 is tremendous. Therefore, government around the globe have to design policies to ease the burden of the people through stimulus policies and mitigate the economic downturn. And last week, you listened to the explanation of Minister Erlangga Hartarto on the government economic uh, stimulus packages. Yesterday, during the cabinet meeting led by President Jokowi, we discussed policies to assist micro, small, and medium enterprises, MSMEs. And this is part of the government effort to defend MSME's financial capabilities. Uh, among the, uh, the policies that taken by the government is the five large scheme to sustain the activities of MSMEs. That is true social assistance program, or we call it BANSOS, tax incentive, relaxing credit, financing, and reallocating local government funds toward MSMEs. And indeed, there is tremendous potential for MSMEs to assist in the growth of the national economy. And as you know that the MSMEs in Indonesia is one of the backbone of our economy. And then, it brings me to the second question, that is the question from Sydney Morning Herald, New York Times, CNA, and Moroccan News Agency. 
The question is related to the progress of the international cooperation and the phone call between President Jokowi and U.S. President Donald Trump. On the last point, President Jokowi has on that last uh, point, President Jokowi has been in close communication with various international leaders I mentioned during my briefing. And all of this communication, President Jokowi consistently highlight three main issues. I had mentioned it in my briefing also. But on top of those three main issues, President Jokowi usually also mentioned about the protection uh, of Indonesian citizen, as the president conveyed during the phone conversation with Prime Minister Modi two days ago. So back to the phone conversation with President Trump. The two leaders compare notes on the situation of their respective country and their effort to fight against the virus. As you know, colleague, that the U.S is one of the most important partner for Indonesia. And the two leaders during the phone conversation underline the importance of maintaining this good relation. And then on the issue of international cooperation, to date there has been support for COVID-19 medication in Indonesia. In all of this, 94 international partners have been involved, comprising of nine countries, nine organization, international organizations, and 76 NGOs. For example, with China, G2G support has been delivered in the form of medical equipment and PCR test kits. B2B linkages in the area of medical supplies have also grown significantly, and moreover, our two sides are exploring potential cooperation in the development and production of COVID-19 related medicine, including, of course, the vaccine. We have also such good cooperation with other countries, among others with Japan, ROK, and also the UAE. UAE. And then responding to the ABC question on the issue of returning Indonesian crew and delays for the ship to dock at the Indonesian port, I have explained it to uh, yesterday actually, during the briefing yesterday, I have explained about this issue. So I would like to, what I would like to underline is that we must trust that the disembarkation process requires careful technical preparation, including fulfilling mandatory health protocol. Such process cannot be rushed. The process requires synergy coordination among various actors from the central and provincial governments. And furthermore, planning for this process must must take place even before the cruise ship departs its port of origin. Indeed, colleague, there is a shortage of cruise ship arrival in Indonesia because other countries have been reluctant to allow this ship to dock and at their port. I would like to uh, reread it again because other countries have been reluctant to allow this ship to dock at their port. We have tried to facilitate the return of Indonesian crew using charter flight. However, this requires flexibility on the part of other countries visited by these ships. And lastly, to respond to Sydney Morning Herald question on the current number of sick foreign national in Indonesia. As of yesterday, 29 April, there, there were 569 COVID cases of foreign nationals in Indonesia. 94 are positive, 306 are people under surveillance, or we call it 
ODP, ODP, 149 have recovered and 17 death cases have been recorded. So I do hope that I have answered all questions directed to me. And again, I would like to invite Minister Tito Karnavian to respond to the questions addressed to him. And then after that will be followed by Professor Wiku. Patito, dipersilakan. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Again, Ibu Retno. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I've got a number of questions here in relation to uh, my role as uh, Minister of Home Affairs. Number one is that uh, how well are restrictions upon Mudik or going home village and prayer, and prayer gathering being observed? Shouldn't every region implement clear physical distancing measures such as not holding mass prayers, no group gatherings to prevent region becoming a red zone? So these uh, uh, questions being asked by CNA, Sky News, and New York Times. Well, number one, in, in relation to the home village or Mudik going home village, uh, the government, central government particularly, already applied what we call is um, stage-to-stage -stage strategy. Because we are taking the lesson from other countries in which applying or issuing too abrupt strategy that could impact a massive number of people, sometimes it can produce counterproductive rather than really productive. It could create chaos, panics, and so on. Once you apply a policy, then people will not be ready with that then they are panicking and even going home to their own villages because there is no hope in the big cities since they lost their jobs and so on. So it happens in some countries. Well, I'm not going to mention to uh, specify what countries really, really uh, experiencing this kind of things. So taking the, the lessons from this issue, so central government in dealing with, uh, again, the issue of Bulang Kampung or Mudik or going home village, Mudik uh, more specifically being reiterated by president. So the first step is that to announce the, to the people, urging the people not to go going home village. Then the campaign was done in a massive way through many features and many channels. A lot of people speaking loudly to urge people, particularly in the Jakarta and surrounding areas, what we call is Jabodetabek, one source of people for going home village, not to go. Then within two weeks uh, of announcing and urging people not to going home village, the government conducted a survey, number of surveys actually. Then those surveys explain that the intent of the people 
for going home village is going down. This is a good result. And finally, Bapak Presiden Jokowi announced very explicitly to ban the people who are going home since the beginning of Ramadan. Then you have got the police and some other state apparatus on the street, show of force. They forbid people, buses and other transportation and stop randomly people whether they are going home or home village or not or to do something else which is very strategic or very important such as health and food and supply and so on. So when they are, they are uh, recognized with the intention of going home village, then the bus is prohibited to carry on, then to return to Jakarta. So based on the number of survey, again, the intent and the number of those want to go home village decreasing from time to time, even though some of them already gone home. But those returning to their home village, actually those already lost their jobs in Jakarta. So rather than staying in Jakarta, doing nothing, and they have to pay a rent house or renting a room and for their own cost living in Jakarta, better for them to let go home to the home villages. But the number of them since, since we have got a very intense campaign for banning them or asking them, urging them not to go home village. So the number of them is trickling rather than flooding. So the capacity, in the meantime, we also instructed all local government from province, regency, cities, even to all villages to provide quarantine. And you know, Indonesia again is blessed in terms of social culture. We are a culture with the social interaction and relationship close one another rather than individualistic and all selfish. So we have got a specific administration in all villages where you have got head, head of village which is recognized officially in our bureaucracy, in our government systems then they are the one in charge of regulating any affairs in the villages. So in their own village, we are instructing them to apply the protocol of ODP or people under monitor to those relatives or friends going home village from town or cities, from Jakarta particularly and greater Jakarta. So they applied to do self isolations for 14 days. But if, they, not, if uh, those people do not have their own specific room to isolate 
in their houses and villages or towns and regencies providing facilities such as schools, facility of education and training belong to local governments, even renting hotels, converting hotels to be quarantine facilities, being paid by the local government based on the reallocating budget. So, so you have got uh, two benefits. Number one, providing quarantine. And at the same time, you assist also hotel to survive, even though in a low level compared to the normal time. Then, from 7 of May, or three weeks before uh, Lebaran or Hari Raya, 7 May, the show of force will be in increased step by step by state apparatus, particularly the police and also uh, of some ranking, some officials from uh, Department of Transportation, security, apparatus, show force, in order to provide a deterrent effect for those who intend to go home village, even though you know that. Sometimes people have got a lot of tricks to go home. Yeah. Well, maybe some of them can go through. Yeah. Then finally uh, reaching their home villages. But the number of them reaching their home village much, much, much lower than doing nothing or having no bin and so on. In the year 2019, we have got around almost 20 million of those going home village or mudik. But now, based on the survey, we are uh, researchers already told us around 1 million already gone home. But again, the capacity of local government, including head of villages providing self-quarantine sufficient. This is still below their capacity. Rather than being flooded by those mudik, people of mudik. So I think in, the, in terms of management of, of uh, going home village for the time being, quite good so far. The second one is that in relation to the social distancing or physical distancing. Well, we have already uh, announced and also brief heads of local government how to apply physical distancing, social distancing, and restriction for social gathering. But in terms of restriction of social gatherings, uh, decision is being made by, by law uh, by Minister of Health. So local government can judge uh, the situations whether the uh, danger of epidemic is high or medium or low. If they think it is high, they, they can propose to the central government, particularly the task force, Professor Wiku will, could explain further about this. And finally, uh, uh, the decision being made by Minister of Health. So this is the, our uh, systems working. 
But physical distancing, social distancing, wearing mask, washing hands, and so on, widely uh, briefed by uh, head of local government and to their own citizens. So, what we need to do is that to brief more details. A lot of innovations already made actually by by uh, local government, such as, uh, again, I would like to answer one question as well in relation to the wet market. In the wet market also, some local government uh, do not ban, but provide a space in which physical distancing could be applied. Same thing, uh, like the one being applied by uh, Vietnam, Vietnamese government. So you have got wet market with box, with painting, so that uh, you have got the space. In the queue up also, you have got uh, uh, space, two meters, with paintings. In transportation also, you have got, uh, you are allowed public transportation, but again, health protocols, hand sanitizers, disinf disinfectant, decontaminated uh, the mode of transportation, and uh, arranging the, the 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 seating, the seats, so that uh, you have got this distance between passengers within the range of minimum of two meters being applied. But then, since uh, well, since Indonesia is a big, a huge country, huge population, 260 million people. Well, it is not easy, and. Uh, over more, we are an open and democratic society. We are not authoritarian country. So you have got the iron first to citizens. It's democratic society, open society, persuasive means being applied in parallel, sometimes with hard measures. But you can do, you cannot do just hard measures. And the next questions in relation to the, well, this is praying. A lot of questions on, on play, praying. Some, 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 some uh, prayers still being done in massive number. We, this is one of the challenge of Indonesia. You know, we are uh, a country that recognize official religion, and everyone must have religion in this country. So, anything to religion is very sensitive. We have to be very careful in making policies in relation to religious affairs. We have urged, we prioritize uh, persuasive measures rather than hard measures or coercive measures, specifically for religious related activities. We already discussed with um, uh, Two organizations relating to religion. Number one is Majlis Ulama Indonesia, Indonesian Ulama Council, particularly relation to religion of Islam. And number two, Communication Forum for Religion, FKUB. So, in order to brief them and share with them, we are not banning religious activities, but 
the problem is that any mass gathering or social gathering in a massive number, this is very dangerous because it is very potential media for widespread of the virus. So informing, sharing, or educating, if you like, to the people, particularly in the religion-related gatherings, it's not really easy. In the case of Aceh, for instance, you have got, they've got a very strong tradition embracing religion. So talking with them, discussing with them on the danger of mass gathering, including praying, need to be done very intense rather than, again, just, you know, coercive measures that could be counterproductive. So building awareness. In the case of Aceh, there is a, a question on showing the pictures on uh, mass praying in Aceh. Well, Aceh is still in the green or maybe yellow or green area with a small number of uh, confirmed cases and only, well, it's not only, only one fatality. Even though it is, it is a signal for us, you know, to be aware, given the fact that again, the graph of contagion is exponential, or, uh, it is a green, still green area. We have to explain to, uh, particularly to the religious figures in Aceh, again on the danger. And we work together with the heads of local government. I talked to the governors. I talked to the governor of Aceh, a number of bupatis and wali kota in Aceh personally, informing the danger and how to approach the religious leaders. Because the role of religious leaders in Aceh is very, very strong to the people. Again, persuasive measures is being prioritized rather than coercive measures. But to some extent, when we found when we found that this area is really red and mass gathering is a problem, then we could do the coercive measures like the one we have done already. If you remember that uh, Jema Tablik in, in uh, South Sulawesi, I talked to the chief of police over there. I talked to the, uh, the governor very, very strongly. I said, well, are you, are you taking the lesson from what happened in Malaysia and South Korea where the outbreak is really rising? because of the religious gatherings. I said, there is no way you have to do it coercive measures now. I talked very strongly again to the governor, Bapak Nurdin Abdullah, and the chief of police, Major General Muktiono. And they executed, they dismissed after talking what quite uh, in strong debate with the religious leaders over there. The final question well I think I have already answered most of the question. Oh yeah, the last one is that in Jakarta where the object is still available well, you know, the government already already 
ban object to take passengers. But object still go on. They can carry on as long as uh, for uh, delivery, such as uh, food delivery or you know uh, restaurant delivery or health uh, items delivery or whatsoever online shopping delivery but they are not allowed to take passengers so if you see the people people taking you know uh, driving motorcycle with passenger it is likely that they are actually immediate family of the driver we are allowing immediate family such as husband and wife of course why we do that how we could distinguish stop randomly in random by the place i already talked with uh, uh, talked to the the chief of jakarta police discuss about this he said already instructed all traffic police to stop uh, motorcycle with two passengers or two drivers right with two people over there whether they are related or not if they are not related they are not member immediate member of family then they are fined they are being ticketed but uh, uh, if they are immediate family husband and wife well they are okay why anyway when they are in the house even they, are, they sleep in the same bed thanks very much indeed good morning Colleagues, foreign press correspondents, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ibu Retno Marsudi, and also Bapak Tito Karnavian, Minister of Home Affairs, thank you for having me here. And thank you for the consistency to inform public and the world how important is unity and solidarity Kotong uh, Royong in pandemic uh, response. This is what is displayed today our external affairs lead our internal affairs lead and you the media and i the scientist get together here to find best ways to inform the public both at home and also abroad i'm wikwa disasmito the lead expert of the covid 19 response uh, national task force i speak before you to represent Pak Doni Monardo, the Chief of the Task Force. First, colleagues, I would like to mention that Indonesia is recognized, among others, for three things. The world's largest archipelagic uh, nation. The second is the third largest democracy in the world. And one of the most decentralized country in the world. Since 1945, 70 years ago, 75 years ago, we called ourselves and proclaimed to the world as Unitary Republic of Indonesia or Negara Kesatuan Republic Indonesia. That cement the foundation of the national and regional collaboration on almost every aspect of our lives, especially in responding to pandemic COVID. The National Task Force is structured in such a way to always have close coordination with the regional task forces, both in the provinces and district, and also munis municipalities. As of now, 34 provinces have established the provincial task forces, and hundreds of districts have their own task forces. Almost all led by their governors, mayors, and bupatis, or head of the districts. For those who have not led by their local government leaders, the Home Affairs Minister have given time for them to revise their structure. This is to make sure that the task force reflects fully the nation motto, Bersatu Kita Teguh, or We Are Stronger Together. Now I will answer questions that were uh, relayed by the international media colleagues. First up, 
questions from Sydney Morning Herald regarding the Indonesia's partners, collaborations, and joint ventures in mitigating COVID-19. To reach the amount of tests needed to be performed nationally, Indonesia government both receives and makes purchases of RT-PCR and RDT antibody kits. Indonesia received help from both government organizations, non-government organizations, and also private sectors. The RT-PCR kits with its necessities and RDT antibody kits were, brought, were bought from companies in several countries, such as South Korea, the United States of America, China, and many else. A lot of countries have provided help for us in regards of test kits, but we selected ones which listed in WHO COVID-19 pandemic emergency use listing for in vitro diagnostics certified by CE, FDA, or equal certifications that have uh, specific targets to SARS-CoV-2. Up until this week, the government of Indonesia has distributed around 1,403,000 PPEs, 128,000 N95 masks, and 438,000 rapid test kits across Indonesia. The President has instructed to provide a guarantee of acceleration of logistics distribution for medical and essential needs between regions. On top of that, Indonesia is now preparing to make our own RT-PCR and RDT antibody kit and so does for the PPE. Moving on, addressing questions from Straight Times, NHK, Moroccan News Agency regarding Indonesia RT-PCR current testing capacity and 10,000 tests that were targeted to be done, and what next? As per today, there are already 46 laboratories around the country that have been actively conducting COVID-19 testing. Those labs are from the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Agriculture, from the Indonesian FDA or Badan POM, and laboratories from the private laboratories. We are doing our best to increase the capacity of testing by laboratories from outside Ministry of Health joining the COVID-19 testing lab networks. We call it a second line of defense. So we have the first line of defense, and then we also have the second line of defense. We already reached 10,000 tests per day as daily maximum testing capacity. Even though we already reached that number, there are still several situations that need to be improved. Delay in reagent distribution, testing queue, lack of resources affect the time needed to increase the testing numbers. We are increasing testing capacity and reduce the queuing number for the time ahead. Next list of questions are from China Central TV, Sky News, AFE, AFP regarding issues of global running of COVID-19 mitigation also on our efforts and intervention in order to tackle the peak. We always monitor the cases from other countries. We also learn how to respond quickly in flattening the curve. For instance, in China, they make the regulations from total lockdown. Meanwhile, in Indonesia, we are implementing so-called large-scale social restriction or PSBB. They also built the, make, the makeshift hospital, while we also built an emergency hospital in Galang Island and utilized the Wisma athlete as centralized quarantine. China also has adopted several stringent measures to combat the COVID-19 during the Spring Festival 2020, whereas in Indonesia, the government of Indonesia has decided to ban traditional mudik, which is exodus, by prohibiting all the flights other transportation, which has been stated in the Ministry of Transportation regulations. However, 
There are several categories of businesses and activities that are permitted to operate during the PSBB, but should obey the health protocols, which have played a big role to fulfill our essential needs. Some modes of public transportation continue to operate as they should with a reduction in the number of the passengers and always keep clean and distance. During PSBB, we as a community must remain alert and maintain our cleanliness in order to prevent COVID-19. The main activities such as study and work also must be carried out at home. Therefore, we need to foster individual and collective discipline behavior as the main factors to not drive the peak infection back. The next question is from ABC in regards to region-specific questions. We appreciate the precise attention specifically for Papua and Bali that have been known to have many potential to solve problems in their special way as same as the other regions. With the uniqueness of each of these regions, our integrated data system unite against COVID-19 or Bersatu Lawan COVID-19 encourages fast and effective coordination all around Indonesia. Hence, the data transparency is the main navigation in Indonesia parallel with the people-centric policies from the grassroots to the highest level working together as the main strength of our nation. Especially in Papua, we are fostering local leadership for the significant results of tracing contact and also people management to stay away from the stigma. Ensuring the quality of health care is very essential for case control. Meanwhile, in Bali, local leaderships and also the culture over there takes major game for these pandemic situations. They are embracing the cultural perspective to combat SARS-CoV-2 threat. Now, moving on the next list of questions asked by our friends from NHK, CNA, Straight Times, AFP, and Morocco News Agency. We have received the highest attention in regard to numbers of cases and patient classifications by PDP, ODP, OTG, and so on. So, we have a difficult task ahead of us. Bear with us more than ever. The idea of an integrated data across the nation cannot be avoided anymore. Now, we are com uh, currently compiling data, data from all levels, such as primary healthcare, hospital, laboratory, and district and city provincial health offices. Close coordination with the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Communication and Information, Ministry of Home Affairs, and also with the regional task forces. Yesterday, we launched an integrated system accelerating data integration called Persatu Lawan COVID. The system can record the data real time and facilitates the public to get information by assessing covid19.go.id. By assessing the website by the public, can get many information such as sex, group of age, symptom, and also comorbid. And we hope that we can give more new information to the public related to COVID-19. However, please bear in mind, in the process of integrating the data, the public should be prepared to see some changes in the data. All the efforts to improve the data validity. Questions from New York Times, Morocco, NA regarding Government of Indonesia prediction that Indonesia will be back to normal in July. Estimations of the human and economic balance sheet during the COVID-19 crisis. I want to make sure that there is no trade-off between the economy and public health. We know how to bring the economy back to life, but we don't know is how to bring our deceased patients back to life. Human life 
come first. Within two to three months, we have to control the economy's bounce back. We are now in progress, analyzing and mapping the scenarios for the restart and reopen economic sector. Last but not least, a question from Morocco News Agency, the situations of children vaccination during uh, this pandemic. In the condition of this COVID-19 pandemic, other health services must continue to be carried out. Vaccination health remains a priority in tackling other infectious diseases in the future. Therefore, in the contagion COVID-19 area, if it is not possible to be immunized, it can be delayed for up to a month. Now, allow me to close this with a message from Bapak Doni Monardo to everyone in all corners of Indonesia and beyond the community must remain alert, be vigilant, and maintain personal hygiene, stamina, and collective health in order to break the chain of infection. Stay at home, study, work, and pray at home. Wear masks to protect yourself and protect others. Keep your distance with others and kill the virus by washing your hands with soap and running water. Safe lives protect the most at risk, the elderly and those with serious health conditions. For Indonesian at home, obey PSBB. It will save your neighbor, your city, your province, your country, and do not mudik. Because it will disrupt the nation food supply. Our cities are built from villages. They are the true backbone of our economy. Please keep our parents, siblings, and the villages healthy. Keep them safe, save the village, save the nation. For the Indonesians abroad, follow the local government's instruction. We are all in this together. We will get out only with the collective efforts, everyone. We need to strive toward an unprecedented unity within this challenging time. As I quote from what Ibu Ratno always said, stay healthy, stay united. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Pa Tito. Thank you very much, Pa Wiku. So colleagues, this is the end of our briefing today. Once again, thank you very much for being with us today and see you next week. And to conclude, Ramadan Karim, stay strong, stay healthy and stay united. See you next week.